Welcome to the Grand Point Church Podcast. We're a church serving the South Central Pennsylvania area with a mission to help as many people as possible take their next steps to find and follow Jesus. If you aren't already, make sure to connect with us online through social media or at grandpoint.church and let us know how God is moving in your life. Now, let's check out this week's message from Pastor Lawrence. I'm going to just come to you from the table this morning because we've got a great table story uh, to talk about today. And also, just to let you know that our service is is kind of in reverse today. There's going to be a whole lot more worship uh, coming back at the end uh, during our communion time. But I just want to take these moments to uh, just bring you a message this morning about that bread of life that we're, we're asking for. Before we do that, though, let me talk to you a little bit about October. Happy October. Welcome to flu season, right? (laughs) So so if you hear my my voice sounding a little bit off today, yes, I do have a little bit of flu, but I'm good. I'm good. I've been tested for that other thing, right? And I'm I'm, I'm good with all that. So just a little bit of a cold this morning. I'll do my best to be able to speak to you and hopefully not cough too much. But I want to tell you about October. You know, there's uh, every everybody has their national days, right? Today is National Golf Day. I don't know if you knew that or not. I don't know if that means anything to you or not. Yeehaw! But uh, it's also it's also a special day in which we call World Communion Sunday, and that means that we're celebrating with believers all over the world in the service of communion. It doesn't matter if you're worshiping in a mud hut somewhere or in a crystal cathedral. We're all kind of in the same place, on the same page, uh, celebrating this bread of life. But also in October, coming up on October 10th, which will be this coming Saturday, uh, we're we're doing a serve day. Serve day. Now, there's two options for you. Uh, Here at this campus, at Grand Point Church Campus, we're going to get together and pull some weeds, take care of some flower beds, and... Uh, trim a few bushes and things like that. If, if you can help with that, uh, we would love to have you come out from 9 to 12 this Saturday uh, just to help clean up our campus. Our campus is maintained by volunteers, and this is just a boost for all of that, so we want to encourage you to do that. There will be coffee and donuts. Now, you could choose just to come for the coffee and donuts if you want to, and I guess that's okay, but I'll tell you, you'll feel a whole lot better about yourself if you pull a few weeds while you're here. Also, on uh, October 10th, we're also participating with an Overflow Church. Uh, We have been partnering with Overflow Church. That is the church in town that is renovating the old Dilly's uh, Bar and Grill, and we've been partnering with them from the beginning. We'd love to see that church up and running by the spring, so they're asking again for any volunteers that might come out. So October 10th, Also, this coming Saturday is an option to help out there, again, from 9 to 12. Skilled and unskilled labor, call the church office here uh, to get additional information uh, on that. And then, I need to tell you to mark your calendars for October 17th and 18th. Now, that means we have Saturday and Sunday services here, so that's both. If you're just a Sunday person, uh, it's October 18th. But we're doing what we call Vision Weekend, Vision Sunday. And that's kind of like, you know, the State of the Union that the president does? And that is the most watched, uh, I think, thing on on TV. So we do a State of the Church. So we'd love for you to come out. And uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about where we're at as a church right now. We've gone through some changes, and we're coming to the end of this crazy year that we've been in. We're going to update you on everything that's there and also the exciting thing that's going to happen on that Sunday is we will hopefully be introducing to you our Greencastle campus pastor. Uh, We're getting very close, and there's some exciting things that are happening. A lot of those decisions are being made final this week, but we'd like to have that introduction on October 18th. So it's going to be a great day, great celebration. And then the last weekend of this month is, again, what we call Next Step Weekend. Uh, We started this uh, last month where we have some baptisms and child dedications. So we're going to do that again on October 24th and 25th. If you've never followed the Lord and Believers Baptism, I'd love to give you an invitation to at least talk about that, explore what that looks like, because it's a great way to celebrate together 
isn't it? Just to have baptisms in our service. So we'd love to have even a, a little bit more of that. So that's an overview of October, but today, welcome into, as Chris said, uh, week number five in our series called Teach Us to Pray, where we're finally, finally getting to that part of the prayer where we can say, give me, right? We love that, right? That's our kind of praying. And we do that all the time. We say, God, just give me a good day. God, give me health or improved health. God, give me safety as I travel. God, give me patience as I spend my day with the kids or, or whatever. We, we're really good at the give me prayers. And so finally, we come to that place where we can say, give me. Now, I love it because it's also about giving me food, right? We're good at that. Give me some food. Give me some bread to eat. When it comes to the culture of the kitchen, people love to talk about food. If you ever need a conversation starter, like if you just meet someone or have someone over for dinner, you're sitting at the table or you're in a circle group and you need something to talk about, talk about food. Everybody can talk about food. Just ask them what their favorite food is. Uh, ask them where their favorite place to eat is. And, and man, stories will start coming out. One of the things that Penny and I like to do in premarital counseling is we'll ask the couple, so who's the best cook, right? And that often brings up some great discussion, even some debate at times about that. But here's one. Here's one. Ask a question about curious dining practices. And there is no shortage of stories. The kitchen seems to be that place where all of us have some experience. In fact, you might even say that we're heavyweights in this area. Uh, you can boo that one. Boo. Um, but, but you ask somebody for a kitchen story or a grill story, and you'll get a mouthful. Uh, Penny's family uh, has a New Year's tradition. So, of course, when I was introduced to Penny, we came into our family, I was introduced to a whole new uh, kitchen culture, right? So her family always, always has a dinner, a big family dinner on New Year's Day. They have a little bit of a German background, so guess what the menu is? <laughs> Pork and sauerkraut, of course. So Penny's dad was the master at sauerkraut. I don't know what he did. He bought sauerkraut in plastic bags. I don't know what brand it was, but he would start cooking the sauerkraut at 11 o'clock on New Year's Eve, and it would cook for 13 hours and before we would eat it. It's kind of a slow cooking process. It was fantastic. I don't know if you like sauerkraut or not, but this was good. So he was the master at sauerkraut. So on New Year's Day, we'd come to the dinner, and there'd be this big, you know, slow cooker of sauerkraut. There'd be the pork and mashed potatoes and all the juices that kind of run with it. So I, I was, you know, familiar with some of that, but the one thing that I didn't understand was all the ketchup bottles sitting across the table. <laughs> ketchup, a squeezable ketchup bottles. I had no idea what that was about until we sat down to eat and all of her brothers and her dad, their plates filled with sauerkraut and pork and mashed potatoes. Then they would pick up the ketchup bottle and just all over, all over, smother this stuff with ketchup, take a fork and kind of just mix it all together. I'm sitting there, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> Never heard of that. Anybody ever hear of ketchup on sauerkraut? You did? Really? Man, I thought her family was the only ones that were, were out there, but they love it. So I asked some questions about that and they said, it's what, it's what we always do. Right? So it's part of the culture of the kitchen. I never got into that. Penny doesn't do it either, but uh, the rest of them did. I heard of another guy, though, who pours syrup, syrup on everything that he eats. Now, I can get that a little bit more, a little bit sweet. No, no sweet. But, but also heard of a guy that puts gravy on his cake. All kinds of traditions that come out of the kitchen. More than one person, perhaps even in this room, was taught never to drink milk or eat ice cream after you eat fish. Have you been taught that? So, so, okay, so I don't know what happens if you do, if some reaction happens. I've never had anything happen, but you never do that. And then uh, um, oh, what, about, what about pie? How many of you eat the point first? See, well, why, the point is the best part of the pie. Why delay the gratification, right? But I heard of one person who starts at the crust and eats all the way in and saves the point for last. So that may be, you know, somebody as, as well. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the old wives' tale that says if you eat ice cream with a spoon upside down, you won't get a headache. Go ahead and try that sometime. See how that works for you. I, I don't know how that would even work. But 
And I'm surprised at how many people hate to intermingle their food on their servings, right? So every serving on the plate has to be separated, right? So you eat your beans first, and then you eat the corn, and then you eat the meat. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it about all to get mixed up anyway, right? <laughs> Why not mix it before? A little bit of history, though, with colonial, in colonial America reminds us that colonial American kitchens used to have a trough in the kitchen floor. And that trough was where you threw the bones. It's also where the dogs sat and waited, right? <laughs> Speaking of dogs, has anyone here ever smuggled unwanted food to the dog under the table? Right, just to kind of help you out. And then when mom just talks about the clean plate, compliments you and the complete clean plate, you just kind of smile innocently. Yep, we got a clean plate. Well, an empty plate or a clean plate in some Latin cultures only assures your host that you're still hungry. And they become offended if you, uh, if, if you do not take that next serving. So there's all kinds of stories from the kitchen, isn't there? All kinds of stories from the table. My favorite uh, table story, though, is about the man who had nine sons. And the rule of the kitchen was simple. Dad always, always got the last piece of chicken. And if he didn't want it, the fastest fork wins. Right? So one night, they're all sitting at the table, 10 men eyeing the last piece of chicken. Thunderstorm came through, caused an electrical blackout. There was the scream in the dark. And when the lights came back on, there was dad's hand on the chicken plate with nine forks sticking in. <laughs> everybody has a kitchen story because everybody has a, a history in the kitchen, right? We all have stories from the table. And our table story today comes from that one line in the Lord's Prayer that says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, those words, though they're brief, raise some good questions, don't they? For example, where's the please? Is it okay to come to the Lord's table and into the presence of God and say, give me? Just start off by saying, give me this day our daily bread. It seems kind of abrupt. It seems too demanding. Wouldn't it be better if we would say, well, Lord, would you please pass some of that bread to us? Or Lord, could we please have some of this bread? Uh, when, when, when our kids or grandkids, you know, are at the table and they're asking for some food, we're like, uh-uh, not until you say, right, please, right, and then we'll give it to them. So is it irreverent for us to simply say, give us this day our daily bread? Well, it is, if that's where we start. But if you remember, if you've been tracking with us through the Lord's Prayer, that's not where we start, is it? We start with the words, our Father which art in heaven. And, and uh, see, we, we begin with this preoccupation of his wonder, not the preoccupation of our stomachs. We're already overwhelmed by the astounding reality that we are God's children and that we have a Father in heaven. That being that has such incomparable wisdom and power that was able to design and create everything that exists, that being is our Father. We are his children. And so, and that deep and abiding recognition of the grandeur and the glory of God is meant to shape and direct everything in our lives, even what we ask for. And so we don't begin by saying, give me. We begin by acknowledging him as our father. And that makes all the difference in what you can ask for and perhaps even how we ask. So when we come to this part of the prayer, I'm already warmed up to the idea that God, my father, wants to give me everything that I need, everything that I need. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus gives us some instructions about asking, and he says this in Matthew 7, verse 7, he says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For, every, for whoever asks, anyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds, and he who knocks, the door will be opened. It's pretty cool, isn't it? And then after Jesus said that, he looks at all the dads that are standing around there, and he says to them in verse 9, which of you, dads, if your son asks for some bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? Even though then you are evil, it's another word for knuckleheads, right? Even though you're knuckleheads, you know how to give good gifts to your children, right? 
Every dad, every good father will give a good gift to their children when they ask. And then he says, how much more? Say that with me. How much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? I love this about our heavenly father. There's two things that I want you to take away from the table this morning. Number one is this. Number one is this. I am able to ask with confidence because I have a father in heaven who loves to give. So when I come to a time of prayer, any time of prayer, I can ask, and I can ask with confidence. One of my favorite verses in the Bible right now is James chapter 1, verse 5. So James is one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. He's also, this James is also the brother of Jesus. But in James chapter 1, he's writing to some Jewish Christians, and here's what he says in verse 5. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask. Ask of God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him or her. I've been asking. In fact, I've been pleading to God for wisdom to know how to lead our church through this crazy year. I have been. And the reason I'm asking is because I'm not wise enough to do this myself. I'm not smart enough to know how to do this, so I'm asking for wisdom uh, to know how to do this. And I also know what happens when you don't. James chapter 4, verse 2 says, you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. So, so here's the suggestion to you. You know, instead of getting upset or mad at your pastor or the church staff or your governor or your employer or the president because they're not leading the way you want to, pray for them and pray for wisdom. Pray that God would grant them wisdom and pray it in Jesus' name. I, I was offering a prayer at a wedding rehearsal a couple of weeks ago, and I finished praying, and a guy came up to me and told me that my prayer was not legitimate. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you didn't end it by saying in Jesus' name. So apparently in my prayer, and I don't remember what I prayed, but I was thanking God for the food and just asked for his blessing. And then I said, amen. But I did not say in Jesus' name. And he said, it's only when you pray in Jesus' name that God will answer your prayers. So even though our food was not blessed that night, I don't want you to miss the blessing (laughs) that comes from asking. See, we live with so much needless stress. So much needless anxiety, so much needless worry and want simply because we do not ask. Does anybody remember the song called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? Did you ever hear that? What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. How much? Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Philippians chapter 4 gives us a a perfect recipe for this as well. It says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, this is great, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I am able to ask with confidence because I have a Father in heaven who loves to give. The second truth that I want you to take from the table this morning is this, and this flows right out of this part of the Lord's Prayer, and that is that I am not independent or self-sufficient. I am not independent or self-sufficient, but I am am dependent on, on the goodness of God for my needs. Now, most of us in the United States have trouble relating to this part of the Lord's Prayer as it applies to food, right? Give us this day our daily bread because most of us don't have a problem with daily food. Our pantries are so packed and our bellies are so full that we seldom have to ask for food. In fact, probably our prayer ought to be more, God, give me self-control over all this food that I have to eat. Right? We say, God, help me not to eat so much rather than God, give me some food. Listen, you won't go to Amazon and find a whole lot of books on how to survive starvation, but you can go to Amazon and find a whole bunch of books on how to lose weight. Right? So our our problem is maybe not having enough food, but maybe it's too much food. 
And, and so we need to explore the deeper meaning perhaps behind what it means when we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And I want you to discover this deeper meaning. And there's a great story in the Bible that helps us understand what that deeper meaning is. So I want you to listen to Callista and Taylor as they read this story that defines what this bread really is. Listen to this. John 6, 1 through 14. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, and a huge crowd was following him because they saw the sign that he was performing by healing the sick. So Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, Where will we buy bread so these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, Two hundred denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Then Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples, Collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, he said, This really is the prophet who was to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. John six thirty two to 35 Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall, not, shall never thirst. So the deeper meaning of give us this day our daily bread is the fact that it's not about food, but it's about a person. Uh, Jesus just fed this large crowd of people, right, with this, these, you know, barley loaves and, and the fish. And the crowd is amazed. They're amazed at his power, and they're excited about his ability to provide for them physically. And they're thinking, this is just the kind of king that we want. Isn't that kind of how we think as well? We want a God who just gives us everything physically that we want, right? Everything that we ask for. God, give us safety, give us food, give us money, give us a good job, give us, you know, all of these things that we tend to ask for. It's a, it's a lot about physical things. And that's exactly what these people were excited about. They wanted a king that would give them uh, these physical, that would provide for them physically. But the, to their surprise, Jesus runs off and he hides. And so when the crowd finally catches up to him, they confess their confusion at his response. And then Jesus answers and says, listen, I came to earth not just to be your physical provider, but I came here to meet your deepest spiritual needs. Now, that turns the page a little bit for us, isn't it? Because God does provide for us physically, but he came to do something much more than that. And he says, every good physical thing that I give you is meant to point you to the spiritual provisions that you will need and that I will make available to you in my life, in my death, in my burial, and in my resurrection. Every physical blessing that we receive is designed by God to, to be a sign that points to the spiritual blessings that are found only in surrendering our lives to him. Now that leaves us with a few questions. What do we really want out of life? What do we really want from God? Do we just want food and health and a good job and stuff? 
Or do we really esteem his work of grace? Do we value his forgiveness? Do we really care about being personally and spiritually transformed? Are we concerned about the character of our hearts and the condition of our souls? Do we have any interest in being holy as he is holy? Or do we care more about stuff? So this really comes down to one question that I'll leave with you today, and that is this. Do we value God's grace, or would we rather have comfortable lives? Nice houses and cars and vacations and cuisine and friends. I want you to listen to some words from the prophet Isaiah, as he wrote in Isaiah 55. And I'm going to read this from the paraphrase of the message because it's so clear. These words become so clear to us, and and I want you to listen. And he begins by saying, hey there. How's that, right? Hey there. All who are thirsty, come to the water. Are you penniless? Come anyway. Buy and eat. Come, buy your drinks. Buy wine and milk. Buy without money. Everything's free. Why do you spend your money on junk food, your hard-earned cash on cotton candy? Listen to me. Listen well. Eat only the best. Fill yourself with only the finest. Pay attention. Come close. Listen carefully to my life-giving, life-nourishing words. I'm making a lasting covenant with you, the same that I made with David. Sure, solid, enduring love. I set him up as a witness to the nations, made him a prince and leader of the nations, and now I am doing it to you. You'll summon nations you've never heard of, and nations you've never heard of will come running to you because of me, your God, because the Holy of Israel has honored you. Seek God while he's there to be found. Pray to him while he's close at hand. Let the wicked abandon their way of life and the evil their way of thinking. Let them come back to God who is merciful. Come back to our God who is lavish with forgiveness. Isn't that cool? These are beautiful words of invitation and grace. And they're spoken in a language that we can all understand. We all know what it's like to be hungry. uh, And we all know what it's like to consume a meal that just doesn't satisfy. Like cotton candy. Right? That just doesn't fill. The Bible uses this powerful... Uh, food metaphor because God wants to communicate to all of us today the fact that there's a deeper hunger within us than just the physical hunger which with, your, with which we are so familiar. Your body hungers to be filled, right? We all know what it's like that. You might be getting hungry right now. You're, you're, you're getting ready to go to Panera here in a few minutes, aren't you? So you're getting hungry. But I want you to know today that your spiritual hung, your, your, your soul hungers even more. And that's a hunger that we sometimes don't recognize. Physical hunger, we know. We feel that. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to the refrigerator as soon as, as we feel physical hunger. But our soul hungers as well. And sometimes we don't know that. But every person who has ever lived, who has ever breathed, has worked in some way to satisfy their soul hunger. And sometimes we don't even realize what we're doing. But we, we, we grab this and we grab that and we buy this and we purchase this and we jump to this relationship and this relationship. We're looking for something that satisfies. God's question for all of us today is this. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? My goodness, we can eat and eat and we're, we're, we're full and a couple hours later like we're hungry again. What God wants to do is give us a bread that never runs out. In the Lord's Prayer, when it says, give us this day our daily bread, that word daily, it comes from a Greek word that is only used one time in the whole Bible. Now, this may not mean a whole whole lot to you, but let me me just say a little bit what that means to us. That means that the writer or the interpreter used a word that was never used anywhere else in the Bible. It actually comes from a Syrian interpretation which Jesus would have understood. But it simply means a bread that never runs out. And that's what Jesus said, I'm coming to give you. I'm coming to satisfy your hunger that never runs out. I'm coming to give you to satisfy your thirst where you will never be thirsty again. And so this morning as we come to the table, that's the story from the table. Jesus came 
and he gives us this bread and, and, and these elements, the bread and the cup come from his own hands. And he says, listen, I want you to eat this bread and when you do, I want you to remember me. I want you to drink this cup and when you do, I want you to remember me. Jesus knew how forgetful we would be, so he wants to bring these elements back to us as reminders of everything that he did to satisfy our deepest spiritual needs. It all took place on the cross. When he went to that cross and just voluntarily gave his life for you and for me, that was the forgiveness of our sins. That was to give us life. That was to give us something that met our needs. That was so that we don't have to go through this life seeking and wanting this and desiring this. That means that we don't have to go through this life fearful of our future, afraid of what's going to happen, filled with anxiety and worry. No, all of that is satisfied in who Jesus is. And so today, it might just be a good reminder for us as we come to the table, as we eat the bread, and as we drink this cup, it might be good for us to be reminded that Jesus came to take care of all those things that our hearts long for, that our souls cry out for. He came to meet those needs. So here's what we're going to do the remainder of our service today. I'm going to, the worship team's going to come, and they're going to lead us in three songs of worship as we gather around the table. And because of our, you know, safety here, we don't want to pass the plates and have a lot of finger prints and touches on the plates, right? We're, we're still doing that. We're going to just do like a, a self-service communion time. We have four tables at the front of the church here this morning that have uh, individual cups of bread and individual cups of drink. The bread, by the way, is separated. It's all by itself. You don't have to touch any other piece. It is gluten-free, right? It's all, it's all good. And uh, we just want to spend this time this morning taking this bread and I know it's a simple element. The bread in and of itself is not going to do anything to you, but the memory, the memory associated with that piece of bread and Christ's broken body is going to energize our spirits this morning as we remember Christ came to meet our deepest needs. And then when we drink that cup, we're going to remember his shed blood for us. We're going to remember that every bit of life drained from him he was truly dead when he came from, down from that cross. He gave his life so that we might have eternal life, a life that, is, that lives forever. And so we want to renew our commitment this morning, and maybe this will be a reminder to us every time we pray, give us this day our daily bread. That's more than just the food on the table. It's him. It's his life that he came to give us. So I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to stand and we're going to worship together. And as we worship, we're just going to ask you to come. Just come. I know it can get a little crowded up here. So maybe just, you know, if there's a long line, maybe you can just sit and wait. There's going to be plenty of time uh, for you to come this morning. But just for practical purposes, if someone in your row gets up, maybe you want, as a whole row want to come out so that you're not jumping over each other. If you choose not to do this today, if you choose not to come, you're welcome just to remain seated or stand where you are and just worship with us. For all of you in the balcony, yes, we're just going to ask you to travel a little bit. Just come on down and just be part of this if you would. And uh, let's just worship at the table today. This is World Communion Sunday. And we're doing this with, with brothers and sisters all over the world today. It's kind of neat to think that people everywhere, every nationality, every country, People all over the world are doing this very same thing, being reminded again of the bread of life that came for us. So let me pray for us, and then we'll worship at the table. God, I want to thank you for this table story this morning. The reminder of that night in which you were betrayed, that you sat around the table with your disciples, and you took that bread, and you broke it. And you told them to eat, and as they do it, to remember you. This was before your body even went to the cross, but it was certainly what you knew was going to happen. And then you took that, that glass of wine, and you, that you passed that around, and you, you told the disciples to drink it, and as they do, to remember your shed blood. This was, this was before you were even pierced and wounded. But it was something, again, that you knew was going to happen. 
But now we're on the other side of this. Everything has happened. All of this now is in the past. But now we come to that same table and we receive the same elements from your hands. And you told us to eat and to drink. And so as we do that now, we're going to remember what has already been done in the past. But we want to make that apply to our present and we want to feast on the bread that satisfies. We want to drink from that which is, never causes us to be thirsty again. And so God, my prayer would be in these next moments of worship that this room would just be filled with minds that are just remembering and hearts that are being opened and maybe even tears that are being shed as we remember the goodness and the love of our Lord who gave all for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening, and we hope you join us for the next message in our Teach Us to Pray series. Connect with us on Facebook and Instagram at grandpoint.church, and until next time, remember that you belong here.